Thank you uh, for uh, being here today. Uh, I have with me Lisa Smitkamp, Fresno County District Attorney, and also Sarah Barton, the Fresno County uh, Crime Victim Advocate. And as has been widely publicized, the community of Fowler has recently experienced a tragic double homicide with a suspect also ending his life with a self-inflicted gunshot wound before crashing into a train. While we will not be discussing the specifics of uh, any sensitive information related to that matter, we will be touching upon issues that occurred in the incident as well as many other domestic violence related incidents. The goal of this uh, Q&A is to provide a resource for anyone who is affected by domestic violence with the emphasis on a detailed breakdown from the early signs uh, of a domestic violence relationship to picking up the pieces, but ultimately speaking to how to um, end the, the cycle of violence and avoid another unnecessary and tragic loss of lives. I'm going to be providing this resource to, to my community. Uh, it's very important in light of what happened in my city, but it will also be a valuable resource to the surrounding communities in our area. We'll begin with a better understanding of what domestic violence is and the cycle of violence, and then we'll discuss what happens if an incident nevertheless occurs and how these cases are prosecuted. Finally, we'll detail the rights and resources available throughout the process. So let's begin. I will uh, start with you, uh, Sarah. How would you define domestic violence? So I would define domestic violence as any violent or aggressive behavior um, within the home. So that can mean between an intimate partner or a dating spouse situation um, or for, former dating partner, um, but it can also be between family members, brother, sister, parents, um, anything like that. So anything that's violent or aggressive um, within the home, I would define as domestic violence. And, and so just to be clear, can, can domestic violence include something other than physical violence? For sure. Um, it can include sexual violence, emotional violence, um, anything that is power and control. Um, so that can mean um, threats of violence. Um, it can mean threatening to um, hurt someone that the victim loves. It can be blackmail, um, threatening to out a victim. Um, there are so many different things that can go into that, um, but a lot of times um, it can include physical violence, but economic, sexual, all kinds of different violence can occur as well. Thank you. Lisa, as a prosecutor, how would you define domestic violence? And that is, you know, what are the elements of the crime? So in order to prove domestic violence, as we prosecuted in the DA's office, I mean, Sarah's depiction and explanation is 100 percent accurate um, in the sense that um, domestic violence is is a, a huge area. It's very broad, very wide. But in, in, in actual prosecution of those cases, the cases that come to the domestic violence unit in the DA's office are those of intimate partner relationships, parent, child, cohabitants, um, former spouses, spouses. Um, and then the relationships between, uh, if there's violence between parents and children or brothers and sisters, those um, those can be uh, treated from a victim perspective um, through through domestic violence because there are intimate relationships. It's not a stranger, but we don't bring those into the domestic violence unit. Um, they're probably in either the general felonies or the the violent felonies. Um, or if there's a homicide, it's not considered a domestic violence homicide. We restrict those. Uh, just to the the parent child, uh, I'm sorry, the the intimate partner or the um, parent of of children, um, spouses, ex spouses. So in order to prove a domestic violence case, the first thing that you have to prove is that there injury, and that's how we decipher a misdemeanor from a felony. Or if we get into allegations of great bodily injury, um, if there was weapon allegations, we add those also. Uh, but you have to prove that there is a um, relationship that qualifies as domestic violence, which is those that we've enumerated. Um, and that can be, it doesn't have to entail a marriage. It, it is a relationship 
um, where they cohabitate or they date or they have a child together or they've been married or or are married. Uh, and there has to be um, that the, an, an assault of some kind and an injury, what we call um, uh, a corporal injury. And that could be anything from a red mark, from a slap to a broken rib to uh, to a black eye to, you know, we've had cases where people get dragged. Um, and there's a very violent uh, attack, but there's not a lot of injury. Um, and we still prosecute those cases. Domestic violence is really formed around the relationship because you can have a domestic violence case that's a disturbing the peace, which is, you know, what we might think of as sort of a lower level misdemeanor, um, all the way up to a homicide. We have criminal threats, which don't require any touching or any injury. Um, and those are verbal, uh, sometimes very, very serious crimes. So what happens is that there is a, uh, a power and control element to domestic violence. And not, a lot of the times it's not about the physical beatings, but it's about what goes on up here in the head. And domestic violence, I would say 99% of the time starts verbally. Um, it starts with power and control. And, it, and it's almost like a grooming of the victim by the defendant to see what they can get, what they can, how far they can push. And domestic violence oftentimes starts out with no hitting, no violence, but just controlling who they see, what they wear, um, what, uh, if they have a job, if they, if they uh, sometimes alienate uh, the, the victim from their family, because that's the beginning of it. Um, and it doesn't have to entail any physical violence at all. And so it's a, it's a real progression as the relationship continues. And so just to make sure that, that everyone understands, so in the, the elements of the crime with domestic violence, you mentioned corporal injury and relating to, to some type of physical act, uh, but to, to cover the other elements of, of domestic violence, the verbal part, that's covered with criminal threats and, and other avenues, is that correct? Yes, so there are several different crimes that can be charged. Um, in the domestic violence world, it, even um, prohibiting somebody from calling the police, you know, taking a phone away, hanging it up, pulling a phone line out. If the relationship is there that they are former cohabitants, cohabitants, they share children together. If that relationship is there, then the crime they commit is considered domestic violence. Um, and the reason that that's important is because there are specific probation terms and specific things that happen after a conviction or a plea uh, that are specific to domestic violence, which is like a batterer's treatment program and, and different things. Because really the goal, once the people uh, who are involved in these situations get involved in the criminal justice system, is not to tear the family apart, but to try to reunify the family and to try to teach them how to have healthy boundaries. So it's to try to teach the perpetrators that you can have relationship differences all day long but you can't hit and you can't demean and you can't, de de you know, denigrate the character of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of your spouse or your partner. Um, same thing for the victims uh, of domestic violence. We like to teach them, yes, you can love somebody who is imperfect, but you, you shouldn't allow yourself to be victimized. And so we send them um, to different types of counseling to try to teach them how to have healthy relationships. And then sometimes they get to the point where they just you know, they can't be together uh, because one one or more partner isn't le learning their lesson. Can, can a domestic violence relationship exist if, let's say, the there's only one date? Can, there, can that be considered a domestic violence relationship? Um, I, I think if, they, if, they're, if they're simply dating and they've never cohabitated or they've never had a marriage or a child, um, it, it may, I mean, that's, that's kind of an extreme situation, but but if they were if they were considered to be in a dating relationship, then yeah, I think we could we could push that through as a domestic violence because it's again it's the nature of the relationship that we look at. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, generally, who are the the victims of domestic violence? I would say um, a victim could be anybody. There really is no like race, gender, socioeconomic class, age, there's no limit to who a victim could be. Um, we really see it in all groups of society, all aspects of society. It does um, it does not discriminate. We see it in all different types of people. Um, we do see women more represented as victims through the court process. 
But that's not to say that men aren't victims as well. We see plenty of men come through as victims also. Um, and I would also say that um, children are often the silent victims of domestic violence because they're the ones in the home witnessing it, sometimes getting caught in the conflict or the crossfire. Um, and they have no no say in what happens. Sometimes they're just they're just the silent victims that have to endure what's going on. Um, so that's important to remember, I think. But but yeah, a, a victim could be truly anybody. And and as we saw with, with the incident in Fowler, the, the ultimate victims were the stepfather and the, and the brother, the young you know, brother. So uh, you're right, it can be anyone. And uh, just a follow up to that, Sarah, generally, who are the, the abusers? Again, it, it could vary, correct? Yeah, yep. An abuser could be anybody. I mean, it would be easy to say that um, an abuser is is only men, but that's really just not what we see. Um, it really just varies because the it just comes down to power and control. Anybody who is trying to use power and control over another person, that's going to be the abuser in the dynamic. So that dynamic can play out in any relationship. And then finally, on on this this uh, idea here, you know, what what red flags, if any, early on in the relationship should one look for in identifying potential abusers? Yeah, um, anything that is overly controlling um, and with with younger people, a lot of times that plays out like in social media. So if um, a partner is like always wanting to know the password to a social media account or even wanting to share a social media account, um, that's that's a big red flag is they're trying to control and, and you know monitor that person's social media. Um, wanting to know their partner's whereabouts all the time. So, okay, once you get to your mom's house, you need to call me so that you need to FaceTime me so I know that you're there. Um, needing to know where their partner is all the time. Um, that's another big red flag that we see a lot. Um, or just um, wanting to get married right away. I hear that a lot too, is well, we've, we're only dating for a month and we, he wanted to get married right away. Um, so anything that is overly controlling about that person's actions or whereabouts, um, like Lisa said, like what they're wearing or where they work. Um, those are other big things. Um, just someone who's not allowing you to live your own life and have control over your own life. Um, that's going to be a big red flag at the beginning of a relationship. And if I, Kernig, if I could just interrupt yeah. real quick. Sarah, great, um, great explanation. And the other thing also is, too, with the phones and the young people is if they track you on your phone and they want to know where you are all the time, that's a big deal for, for people with, with the smartphones today. But I think another thing that's really important is that some of the things that Sarah has described, which are stereotypical, are very flattering in the beginning of a relationship. You think, oh, my gosh, this is my Prince Charming who loves me so much. He doesn't want me to look sexy in my V-neck shirt because other men are going to think that, you know, they, 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 that I'm beautiful. And isn't that romantic? And, oh, he's so, he's so, you know, into me that he's just so protective. And so a lot of those things that seem very Prince Charming-like, um, they, they, they turn out to be the precursors and what we call the red flags for domestic violence. Both. Uh, very good points on that. Thank you. If, if if one recognizes the red flags early on and stays in the relationship, is that when the cycle of violence begins? And I guess please explain this this concept of the cycle of violence and why it's so hard to stop. Why don't victims leave at the first sign of abuse? And why do they feel trapped? And uh, we'll start with you, Lisa. Okay. So that's a that's a big question and it's a, a lengthy answer, but I, I'm going to try to be as succinct as possible. So most of the time, domestic violence starts in the mind in the sense that they start to gain mental control over. And that process could take two weeks, two months or a year. It just depends on where both of the people come from. Um, some of the times in my experience with victims who have been hesitant to testify uh, in court, I have often told them that the statistics are extremely frightening when you look at children who are raised in domestic violence home, because oftentimes the domestic violence victim is someone whose parents had a domestic violence relationship and the same for the perpetrator, because as human beings, we all do what we know. 
So oftentimes the, def the, the perpetrator will come from a domestic violence home um, or have other mental health issues or insecurities that cause them to be violent. A lot of the times when you throw drugs and alcohol use in there, that is a, just an, a, it's like fuel on the fire um, for, for these, types of, these types of issues. And so what we have to violence is that you have this wonderful where things that happen between people appear to be wonderful. And there are many domestic violence perpetrators who do the wine and roses, right? They do the Prince Charming. They are kind. They are sweet. Um, they buy gifts, they they act nicely, they are very kind. And then once they feel that they have the person where they want them, then the that, that next phase of the cycle of violence is the explosion phase where something happens that, that should be very insignificant, like dinner isn't ready, somebody's late coming home, uh, the coffee isn't hot. And I'm not being flip when I say that. I mean, this is what causes some people to lose their mind and to to commit horrific acts, especially if they are under the influence of alcohol or they are under the influence of any type of illegal drugs. Um, and then, then, then you have the explosion phase. And that's when 911 is involved or the family is involved or the neighbors are involved. And it starts to sort of leak out that this, this behavior is, is going on. And it's so shocking. Usually the first time that it happens, nobody really knows how to respond. Um, and then, of course, there's the cooling off phase and the recovery phase where it's the I'm sorry, baby, I love you. And then it's the blaming, you know, but you made me do that. My love for you is so strong. I just can't, I can't handle it when things aren't great with us. And I love you, I love you, I love you. And we're going to be together and I'm never going to do it again. And then it all starts through the honeymoon phase again. And so what happens, the, the average person uh, is victimized seven times before they actually contact law enforcement. And so by the time they come to us or by the time Sarah gets them in the victim service center, this has been going on for some time. Um, and and in, in the Fowler situation where you have somebody who then exhibits the, the violent behavior toward other family members, sometimes that's just a way to get back at the person. When you are intimate with somebody, you know their heart, you know what makes them tick, you know what makes them happy, you know what's precious to them. A lot of the times in domestic violence, we'll see the perpetrators burn clothes, they burn um, bur burn special um, uh, sentimental clothing or dolls or property. Um, and a lot of the times they will go after the family members, they will threaten the children, they will threaten the mother, they know what's precious to the victim and they want to take that away from them to exhibit that power and control. Lisa, uh, Sarah. Yeah, um, I'll, I, I'll just touch on um, why it's hard for victims to leave. Um, there are so many different reasons why victims stay in an abusive relationship um, or just find it difficult to leave. Um, the thing that I hear a lot is for financial reasons. Um, so maybe the abuser is their child care and they watch the kids while the victim goes to work. Um, so it's really hard for them to imagine what will my life look like if I don't have someone to watch my kids or pick up my kids from school. Um, that's something that I hear so often. And then the other thing which is similar is um, maybe the abuser is the breadwinner in the relationship. And if without the abuser, the victim doesn't know how they'll put food on the table or provide for their family. Um, but the other thing that we hear a lot is that um, victims care about the abuser. They want them to get better. They want their family to be whole. They want their kids to have both parents in the picture. Um, they have hope that the abuser will be able to get better and will be able to work on these problems. Um, so that is something that I that I hear a lot as well. Um, but it's also, it also can be fear, fear that um, the defendant will hurt someone that they love. Um, I just had um, a victim tell me that um, the abuser knows where her child is. Her child is not with her. She's in a different country. And the abuser knows where her child is staying in that country. And so he threatens that he'll go and find her child and do something to her child. Um, so sometimes it's worry that the abuser will hurt someone that they love or hurt them again. Um, sometimes leaving is the most dangerous part. That's the lethality goes up when the victim decides to leave um, and victims know that. So it takes careful planning to make that step because they know that 
the the risk to them is going to go up um, and the risk to the people that they love. Um, and then often things like like immigration status or sexual orientation, those things are also held as a, a control factor. If you leave, I'm going to tell, um, I'm going to report you to ICE or I'm going to tell your family that you're gay. Um, things like that I hear as well. Um, so the abuser is their support system or um, they want their family to stay together. Um, they love this person um, or just fear threats, things like that. And, and, and thank you for highlighting immigration status. We'll be, we'll be touching upon that a little bit later. And, you know, I, I think, uh, Lisa, you mentioned that seven times uh, before, before something happens. And I, I guess, uh, Sarah, in relation to that, if someone's able to actually leave the ab abusive relationship, what's the likelihood of entering into another abusive relationship with another? Yeah. Um, that is something that we see a lot, unfortunately, um, is that um, victims will leave one abusive relationship and then soon after enter another one. And um, that's that's really unfortunate. And I guess the way to um, combat that is education, teaching people um, what a healthy relationship looks like, what are those red flags that we can recognize at the beginning of getting to know somebody that can prevent um, them getting into that situation again. Um, but also therapy, I think, is really important. Um, victims being able to talk through, you know, um, what, what patterns in relationships that they can recognize that will help them go to a healthier relationship with people. Um, and the program that we work with um, at Crime Victim Assistance Center, um, the Cal VCB, they, they pay for therapy. So that's something that I always encourage victims to do um, is take advantage of that. Um, that therapy is paid for through that program um, and we can help with that application process and all that. But therapy is so, so important for people to, you know, process the trauma that they went through um, and also just talk about what a healthy relationship looks like. How, what am I supposed to be treated like when I'm in a relationship? And, uh, Lisa, so how often do domestic violent, violence offenders face subsequent criminal prosecution? How often do, do I'm sorry, I don't understand. So, the so it, there are incidents and, and a lot, let's say, uh, go unreported, which we'll be talking about later. But how often do you actually see a repeat offender in the courtroom? Or is, oh, is that the same all, number? All the, all the time. I actually have personally prosecuted several people over the course of my career in repeated uh, is with the same victim and also different victims. And I've also, as Sarah said, you know, I've had a, a, a victim come through and the perpetrator goes to jail or prison. The relationship breaks up and a year later she's back as a victim with a different person. Um, and that, I think that happens more with female victims than it does with male, uh, because the reasons for domestic violence uh, in, in male and females tend to be a little bit different. But I think we don't, I don't know that we have stats on, on, on that kind of, the, the question sort of that you're asking, because so many different people deal with domestic violence in different ways. There are, Fresno, is a, Fresno County is a huge melting pot. pot. So we have so many ethnic diversities here in Fresno. You know, we have a really big Hmong community. We have a big Armenian community. We have a, a, an Indian community. We have a Muslim community, obviously a big Christian community, which, you know, a lot of people who have religious backgrounds integrated into their, um, into their, into their race also, um, they have standards that they um, that they have from their religious upbringing and their family upbringing that sometimes don't involve uh, the, the involvement of law enforcement in what they call family problems. So the Hmong community is one that is just such a beautiful community with diverse, uh, you know, um, traditions, and they have um, they have elders in their in the Hmong community, and when people in the Hmong community have um, marital issues, they go to the elders. That's part of their process and how their community supports each other. And sometimes by the time they do get to law enforcement, the domestic violence is so bad. You know, we're talking about guns and weapons and threats of violence and threats of death and all these things to where sometimes, um, you know, I, I feel as a law enforcement officer um, and somebody official that we could have maybe helped a little bit more in the beginning, but you have a lot of shame that comes 
with being a domestic violence victim. Uh, and there's not a lot of people that tell. And when they do tell, some people are afraid, even if they don't have immigration issues, to involve law enforcement because the crux of domestic violence is that you're talking about somebody actually exposing their dirty laundry to strangers about someone that they love. Because when someone breaks into your house and they steal a bike out of your garage or you go to the store and someone steals your car, you don't know that person. And so, you know, people are more apt to say, let's call the cops and let's get in, get them involved and let's get that person um, accountable for their behavior. But when you're talking about domestic violence, you're actually asking people to call the police, participate in the process and actually prosecute someone that they love. And love is not a light switch. It doesn't go on and off, on, off, on, off like that. It's a it's a very difficult situation because because someone is beaten or abused or degraded by their spouse, it doesn't mean they stop loving them. They get angry with them. They get frustrated with them like people who are in non-domestic violence relationships do, but like we all do, whether it's a parent, child, whether it's a sibling, whether it's a, a loved one or a loved one, a, 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 a spouse, we all rebound and we all forgive and we want to be forgiven. And so that natural human conduct that we have also applies to domestic violence. And um, where some spouses might be concerned because the wife has a shopping problem and she spends too much money on shoes, you know, that's a, a situation they get into it and they fight and they argue and then it gets better. It's the same thing for if he comes home drunk and dinner isn't ready and he smacks her in the face. They go through the same process of healing the relationship that nonviolent conflicts do. And so when it comes down to pushing through the system, it's very taxing on people. And it's embarrassing that your relationship is in a point like that. And we all have a natural human tendency to want to protect people that we love. So it's a very trying time for domestic violence victims. And it's, 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 you know, we, it's easy for, for those of us who've never been in those types of situations to say, what is wrong with these people? Why aren't they leaving? And, and I say it all the time as a young prosecutor, when they assigned me to domestic violence, I thought, well, why don't they just leave? Who would do that? And as I as I started to spend time with victims and I started to understand their position, that's when I became such an advocate for domestic violence because and, and domestic violence victims and awareness and education, because it is so understandable when you understand their situations. And that's a really good point in terms of, you know, just that human element that complicates things. And so. Uh, you also mentioned, Lisa, about the Hmong community and, you know, going to the elders and sort of the role of family, I guess. How, how can family and friends, and this question is for both of you, we'll start with Lisa since she touched upon it. How can family and friends intervene if they suspect abuse? Is there a, is there a way that it should be, you know, they should go about it? Yeah, I think there's, you know, depending on the relationship of the person who is who notices it and wants to help. I think you just have to do it very tenderly and you have to really empower the victim to find his or her own way through resources and education. And I, you know, when I was in the courtroom for many, many years with domestic violence victims, the first thing I would say right out the gate is I'm married. I have trouble with my husband all the time. And when we fight or argue, he gets in the car and leaves. I could be right in the middle of it. And saying, this is what we need to work on. All of a sudden he goes because he's non-confrontational. And when I'm mad at him, I go buy a really nice pair of boots. You know, that's what I do to get back at my husband is buy new shoes. And, you know, it sort of breaks the ice a little bit so that they know that, that I don't live in a perfect marriage. I don't, nobody does. So that's the number one thing is to come at it from a point of understanding. And then the second thing is, is that you, you have to really empower them to know that the object of your expression of concern is not to tear the marriage apart because that's the end of the road. The, the object should always be to get them help, to get her help, to get him help, whoever it is, whether it's dealing with anger, because really we are all broken children inside of big people bodies. And so much of what happens in a domestic violence relationship comes from our childhood. And it's fears and insecurities and, you know, maybe some failures or regrets that we have along the way of, you know, not being educated enough to support ourselves financially or coming from a relationship 
um, with our parents that didn't make us feel safe. And so we look to other people to try to provide a, a sense of security for us. And, and there are all of these human emotions that, that come into play that get in the way of really helping people be healthy. And I think that if you come at it from a, a place of love and concern and, hey, let's help you fix this, then it's not scary to them. And they, they, they look at it like that. And another thing I think that's very important, especially for moms, of children is that, and I've always sort of used this as a, a breakthrough point, is to say, you're an adult, and yes, you you might say, okay, I'd rather take a beating once a month, or I'd rather be be put down so that my kids can have a bed and food and shoes and all those things, and I can take it because I'm an adult. But what is really, I think, empowering for for moms is to is I is I tell them your chances of your children entering into these relationships when they are old enough is much higher if they continue to live in this dysfunction. Uh, and that mothering sort of um, feeling and that, that, that mama bear comes out in them. And so a lot of the times domestic violence victims don't wanna get help for themselves, but they wanna make sure that their children are raised in a more functional system and family so that they again, don't become victims and perpetrators themselves. And so that's also an empowering thing and just something to help people realize why it's important to to change the narrative in their in their home and in their relationships and there's so much help out there you know there's there's a lot of churches that have you know programs like celebrate recovery they also have pastors and people and you know their churches that are um very well versed in domestic violence because i know because they reach out to us and they have plans and they can call the marjorie mason center and you know victim witness service centers if they're involved in the criminal justice system there's a lot of places that have resources to help. Um, and, and I think it has to start with the victim because everybody can talk at the, the, the perpetrator all day long, but if the victim doesn't sort of stand their ground, then it's not, it's not fruitful. That was very insightful. I mean, I really like the point about just kind of meeting them at where they are, at their level. And, you know, any apparent shame, you know, removing that, taking down, taking down that barrier. I think that I would go a long, long way. So, uh, Sarah. Yeah, I think just to piggyback on it, um, to you can you can express concern. You can say, "Hey, I'm really concerned about what's going on," but it has to be without judgment. It has to be come from a place of love. And I I love what you said, Lisa, that um, you can't make them think that you're trying to break them up or end the relationship because that's just going to push them away. They, they will push you away right away. Um, that's not what they want in that moment. Um, and we have to trust the victim's process of when it's time for them to leave, when it's time for them to, to work on it for their kids. They know what's best for them in their relationship. And what they really need is to know that people in their life support them, um, to know that no matter what happens, that they can go to their to their friend or family's house um, if things get really bad. Um, they need to know that people are there for them no matter what. Um, because a lot of times what family members do is cut off, cut the victim off because they're saying you're in this relationship and I don't agree with it. And so I'm not going to talk to you anymore until you leave, until you leave this person. Um, and that's just not helpful because then that's another person that the victim can't go to when they need to. Um, and then another thing that um, family and friends can do is help to safety plan with the victim and be part of a safety plan. Um, so if I text you this code word, then that means that you need to call the police or you need to come help me. Um, so talking through those steps with, with the victim, safety plan, being a part of that plan um, can be really important later on. And, and while it might have been addressed in, in your answers uh, to both of you, you know, specifically, we talked about red flags for the, the, the victim, the potential victim, for families kind of just looking in, what should they be looking for? Well, we talked about if they were to intervene, but what should they be looking for to, if they're suspected of this? So uh, I the obvious first sign would be any, any bruising, right? Adults, you know, we always have a thing in child abuse with uh, children who are bruised from the waist down. That's usually normal childhood, but children don't usually get bruised from the waist up and certainly not in the facial area. So it's the same thing for women um, or men. You know, if you see bruises, if you see facial swelling, most people don't get in bar fights every Friday night. 
Um, you know, the black eye is always the you know traditional sign of domestic violence, but a lot of the times it's bruising in the arms or it's it's hits to the to the rib cage. Um, a lot of domestic violence perpetrators are smart and they've been through the system, so they hit in the head because it's very difficult to see under the hair. Um, it's very difficult to see injuries to the to the head and to the scalp. But physical injuries are number one. Um, because not a lot of people, everybody bumps their leg every once in a while or might bump their arm or have a bruise from a shot. But if you see things like that, that's obviously the number one red flag. I think the other red flag really is just seeing a personality change in the person who you know and love, somebody that you work with, when they become um, sort of re uh, reclusive or they become depressed or they're not normally their, their cheery self. Uh, that's, that's a big sign because they're hiding uh, they, domestic violence victims lie to their friends and family all the time. Sometimes they say, oh, yes, I'll be there at this barbecue, or oh, yes, I'll be there at this baptism or family event, and then they don't show up. Um, and they come up with some excuse that really doesn't make sense. Uh, I think those are, are specific signs. A lot of the times, the people who are um, the most well-versed in detecting domestic violence are those people in the workplace. Where, where they work with the person and they see these, these telltale signs or they'll say, oh, I, you know, I can't wear the, that clo those clothes anymore. I had, I had one case where the lady said, hey, you always used to wear such bright colors and, and you always looked so happy and cheerful in your clothes. And now you're just, you know, you're always wearing grays and navies and blacks. And she said, oh, my husband doesn't like me to stand out, you know, and that was something where the coworker had later said, because this lady was injured significantly. And the coworker felt horrible uh, because she said, you know, there were so many things like that that she would say, just little things that seem insignificant, um, but that are telltale signs of, of that control. So I think those are some of the red flags you can look for. And I'm sure Sarah has more. Those are all great points. Sarah, uh, if you have anything to add. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it. I mean, another one that we can look at is like phone related stuff. So like always like they got a text and they they need to text back right away. Like if they miss a call or a text that they're worried about it, um, being on the phone all the time or FaceTiming all the time for younger people. Um, if their partner, boyfriend, girlfriend um, always needs to be on the phone with them in some way, that's a big thing. And then, yeah, just not, not showing up to family events when they used to. Um, that's a sign of the abuser starting to isolate them from their friends and family, which is a big thing that happens as well a lot. Okay, so now if the victim cannot stop the cycle and the abuser um, cannot change, uh, then either an incident occurs uh, and it's reported or it goes unreported, how many, uh, how many would you say in your estimation go unreported uh, domestic violence incidents? That's a, that's a really interesting statistical question because every time we, every time we look at national stats and FBI stats and local stats and, and you know, our in-house stats and we say, you know, domestic violence, and it's, it's interesting you say that is, you know, COVID has been a really interesting thing because some people say domestic violence is up 40 percent some say it's up 60 percent um, and the reporting is difficult because everybody was in shelter in place right child abuse calls from cps went down significantly because of people not being around so not being around uh children not being around their teachers and, and such so it's very difficult to estimate um how many people we don't know about um but 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 taking the stat that what we what we do know is that if the average victim is victimized seven times before they report, then I would say it's seven times of what we see. That you know that would be my guess. I don't I don't know that there are national or local stats on how many are unreported because you you don't know what you don't know. Um, but we and and there's so many people that seek out other forms of assistance than the criminal justice system that have confidentiality issues, and so we don't get those stats. So if people seek out private counseling, that's protected by the, you know, counselor patient privilege or the or HIPAA doctor patient. Um, now, when you go to an emergency room with a broken clavicle and somebody in the hospital suspects domestic violence, yes, they report it. But there's so many times that people go to the ER with issues and they come up with a really great story and there's no way for anybody to really know the truth. Um, and then also people seek out that that. Um, 
that relief or that guidance from their churches. And that, you know, that's also protected. So it's very difficult for us to know. Uh, but I think the thing is, is if the if the if the the perpetrator continues to abuse, they are going to continue that cycle until something stands in their way, whether that's separation, a church elder, a parent, um, a drug and alcohol counseling, judicial intervention, which is usually the 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 sign that it's getting really bad. Um, and I and I tell victims that sometimes when they when they are at the beginning of their of the, of the violence. I say, do you know how lucky you are to be here that you don't have to go through years and years and years of this? Because the longer it goes, the harder it is to unwind. And sometimes that's there in the system because a neighbor called 911. It's not them or a coworker or a nurse or somebody. And so they are afraid of what's going to happen. And uh, sometimes I tell them the worst thing that happens to you sometimes often feels six months later, like the best thing that happened for you. So because you do get the help, you do get the counseling. And the longer the perpetrator goes in that terrible behavior, the harder it is for them to get out. Sarah, do you have any uh, other information to add on numbers of unreported? I don't. I, I, I don't know that stat. Um, yeah, I think it would just be really hard to measure. So what, well, let's say it does go unreported, uh, Sarah. Can you give some reasons why a victim may not report an incident and, and how do we encourage those victims to report and seek out? I know we touched upon it a little bit. But. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, I mean, one example that Lisa gave earlier is that victims, sometimes they have their own systems that they would prefer to go through, cultural systems or family systems um, that make more sense to them. Sometimes the criminal justice or law enforcement system doesn't really feel they feel it doesn't apply um, maybe until it gets really bad. Um, and sometimes we've seen that like the, the community will come together and say, okay, it's time to involve police because this is beyond our control. Um, so sometimes it, it's not the first thing that they think of when a conflict comes up. Um, or sometimes people have gone through, have maybe gone through the criminal justice process. Maybe they've um, been to court before for the same um, situation, domestic violence, and they had a bad experience. Maybe it was um, really hard for them to be in there, um, to see the defendant there or have to testify. That's just a really hard thing to go through. And maybe they don't want to go through that again. Um, I do hear that sometimes. Um, and then others know that sometimes calling the police or reporting violence can lead to more violence. It can become more dangerous for them. Um, so again, they're they're the experts in in their relationship, in their partner and their partner's behavior. So if they know I'm going to try to call police again, um, but last time I did that, it, it just made things worse, um, then they're not going to do it again. Um, maybe until it gets so bad that they don't have enough, any other choice. But um, but yeah, it's it's different for for every person. Um, and I think it's just important to whenever we do have contact with victims to make sure they know the resources out there. Um, they know that there are people there for them whenever they are ready. Um, that's, that's always what I try to focus on when I meet people in court um, is here's what, whenever you're ready to leave, here's what you can do. Here's what's available to you um, without judgment. And, and again, uh, immigration status may be an issue here coming up in terms of. Right. Care. Yes, exactly. So Lisa, for moving on to the actual reported incidents, you know, how many do police in Fresno County respond to per year? Mm -hmm. Thousands, thousands and thousands. And we have approximately between 2,500 and 3,000 felony domestic violence cases that are sent to the Fresno County DA's office from all of the law enforcement agencies in um, in, in Fresno County. And that includes, you know, Fresno PD, Fresno Sheriff, Clovis, Kalinga, you know, all of the outlying areas, Selma, Ridley. Um, and, the, and those are just the felonies. Uh, so those are, those are corporal injuries that rise to the level of, of a felony. Um, and we have um, over 20,000 misdemeanors um, sometimes. So they are, they, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of domestic violence. Not all those cases are filed. Um, sometimes we don't have enough evidence. Sometimes we don't have the proper relationship. Sometimes the victims are not cooperative. Um, but we do try to bring as many cases to court so that we can assist. 
we can get the people into the batterers treatment program um, and 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 move them through a system that may be beneficial to them. So it is a it's very complicated. Um, it's a it's a very complicated um, process for law enforcement. It's a very complicated process for prosecutors, defense attorneys, for courts because of the nature of the of the loving relationship and the fear factor that goes in. So the 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 cases that come through, um, we we try to deal with them in the best way possible so that the families can um, see the opportunities available to them because there are people that come in and say, I'm done, I want out, I want to prosecute, I want to cooperate. But those people are probably few and far between. Um, when you become a domestic violence prosecutor, or I'm sure an advocate too, uh, you 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 sort of live with the idea that every time you open up a new file, you're not going to have a cooperative victim. And we always say in the DA's office, when we have an overly cooperative victim, something's wrong, because nobody should be excited about prosecuting the father of their children or the mother of their children. So so, and when they are, sometimes there are ulterior motives. Maybe they are going through a divorce. And they want to use the domestic violence situation to their benefit in child custody or visitation. Um, and that's another thing that we have to watch out for, too. That doesn't happen very often, but it does. Um, and so we have to make sure that, you know, the, the cases aren't over exaggerated or that the victims are being honest um, with regard to what's happening. So it's a it's a fine balance for the courts and it's a fine balance for the prosecutors to try to properly assess those cases. And when you have that high, high, high volume of cases, um, you know, it's it's overwhelming sometimes for the system. But we do the best and we we allocate a lot of resources to domestic violence in the Fresno County DA's office. We have eight prosecutors specifically just for domestic violence in the felony unit, plus a chief. Um, plus, we have somebody that does our, our rural uh, grant, uh, the Violence Against Women in Act. Um, we have a team of investigative staff and support staff that are there. We have one um, advocate in-house, and then we work very closely with the Fresno County Probation Department. They have an amazing um, victim advocacy program there that I've always been so proud to work with. And I don't know, Sarah, but I'm just so impressed with your knowledge. Um, as, a, as, an, as an old girl doing this for a long time, it's so nice to see the, the younger generation coming in and caring about this. Um, I also sit on the board of the Marjorie Mason Center, who is a, also a great partner uh, to law enforcement. And even though they have tremendous confidentiality and they don't share things with us, we do cross education with them. And our prosecutors go in and talk to their advocates and sort of explain the system to them. Um, and, and something I think that's so interesting is uh, talking about sectors of population of domestic violence victims. Uh, most of the people who seek uh, assistance from the Marjorie Mason Center do not have active cases in the justice system. Um, they are taken there by uh, sometimes by family members or they they go in themselves. Sometimes they're even taken in by law enforcement officers who respond to their calls. Um, and if they don't, uh, if there if there's a situation where they don't choose to prosecute or we we don't have evidence they're not being forthcoming, at least law enforcement gets them there. Um, and they can seek shelter and they can seek services to the Marjorie Mason Center also. You know, Lisa, just as a just kind of follow up, uh, for those who uh, have not been part of the process and maybe a little bit nervous about what happens with reported incidents, let's say that it's reported a neighbor or they report it, you know, what what can someone generally expect when a police officer arrives at the scene? So that's very interesting. And post OJ Simpson, um, law enforcement has completely changed the way that they do things because pre OJ Simpson, there was a, a sort of a mentality in law enforcement that if the if the perpetrator and the victim were there and the victim said nothing happened, even if she was bleeding, then nothing happened and they shut the door and they left. That was the old school way. And, and that happened for many, many, many years where it was domestic violence was seen as a family problem. Um, today, if there is a domestic dispute and the officers arrive and they see that there is clear injury to one uh, or both of the parties, somebody is going to be taken from that scene and most likely booked um, into, into jail. Um, and then the process there, whether it's a misdemeanor or felony, is, you know, goes through and, you know, we have a lot of overcrowding issues and sometimes misdemeanors are cited right out of the jail. 
Um, but what we have found, as uh, Sarah indicated before, is when there is law enforcement um, intervention, sometimes it gets worse when that person comes home uh, or is set free. And you could have all the restraining orders or the emergency protective orders you want in the world, and sometimes that doesn't stop people. Sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't. And so the, the danger um, to the victim goes up, and so that's why it's important to get her into her, her or him into some uh, shelter or, or other housing. So there's a lot of things that go on. When the police arrive, they assess the situation, they try to interview as many parties as they can. If there's children, um, if there's a 911 tape, that's usually very uh, helpful because it actually records the incident sometimes as it's happening. If somebody has called on an open line or a child is called, and so we're able to use that as evidence also. Um, but but assuming that they get there and there's 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 clear indication that someone has been injured, um, the the person who uh, appears to be the aggressive party um, will be taken. If they have left the scene uh, already by the time the police arrive, then a full investigation will be done, and the the law enforcement officers will get information with regard to the nature of the relationship, the level of injury, and oftentimes they will seek a photograph of the perpetrator because many, many, many times we will have victims who come to court later and deny that it is the person who it really is. So if, if at the time that they are under the stress of the situation, they can get the person, the victim to identify the person who injured them um, via a photograph in the home, or even sometimes um, officers are able to pull up a California driver's license if the person is identified by name, they will get that photographic identification, which then helps us a lot down the road when the victim does recant or does change her story. Because it's very easy to do that, to say, oh, you know, it really wasn't him. I actually got in a bar fight. And the reason that I was upset was because he was dancing with another girl. And it really wasn't him who did this black eye to me. It was the gal he was dancing with at the bar. And I just came home and lied. I just came home and said it was him. And I called 911 and or I slipped in the shower. All kinds of excuses. So when we get that identity right at the scene to say this is the person who did it, then we, you know, we have tactics that we can use to try to admit that evidence. And depending on what the level of, of injury is and, and what, what the criminal history of the defendant is, that's how we deal with the cases once they come to court. You know, uh, you mentioned something with like the photographic uh, uh, evidence and taking a picture. You know, have you seen or, you know, uh, accepting an emergency protective order, have you seen instances where the victim just says, no, no, I don't want that, don't take my picture, is just hesitant about um, those actions taken by police officers? That's very common, especially when the victim is not the person who has called law enforcement out. Sometimes they won't answer the door. Sometimes they refuse to have their photographs taken. I personally had a case one time where a lady was um, beaten so badly and she called 911. She reported it. She said who it was. She identified him. And when a year later came and it was time to go to trial, she was on the stand. She denied it was him. She she said it was someone else that had inflicted the injuries. And when I presented 35 photographs of her body, she denied that her arm was her arm, that her torso was her torso, um, that that her leg was her leg, because she she he didn't hit her in the face. He hit her from the shoulders down, just a terrible, terrible beating. And there was one photograph where um, on her arm she had a birthmark. And so I, I had the court uh, request that she, you know, bring her sleeve up um, and show the jury her arm, which had the matching birthmark. And that was the only way that I could get it in that it was her because she denied every single photograph because the technician, the eyebrow technician never took a photo of her face that night. And so, you know, showing a full frontal uh, photograph of all of her. So it was very easy for her to do that. And of course we got around it, we found a way. And I thank the good Lord every day for that, that birthmark um, because that was the only way I could get it in. So yeah, that happens all the time. So my next question, we, we touched upon a lot of it, but uh you know, maybe anything that we missed here, but with the actual call, with the actual 911, and this question is for both of you, with the actual 911 call, does that assist with stopping the cycle? And then, you know, Andy, go into detail, Lisa, about additional instances you've seen, and then Sarah, you know, explain why the victim may not be ready to leave that abusive relationship even after reporting the incident. Uh, and again, I know we've touched upon some of the elements of this, but we'll begin with you, Lisa. 
Yeah, the 911 call is probably the best piece of evidence outside of the injury photographs. And when we have cases where we don't have um, significant injuries or they're verbal threats or they're pulling the phone out or, you know, again, you know, we've had cases where I, I had a case where a lady was dragged out of her home by her feet in the winter. She had sweat, sweatshirt and sweatpants on and she was actually physically lifted up by him and put into a dumpster. And she had very few red marks. You, you can't even imagine, but, you know, the hood of the sweatshirt had come up. And so thankfully her body was not injured. It wasn't scraped up. It wasn't, but the, the way she explained the things that he said, the threats that he made, the way that he threatened her children, um, he had pulled the phone out of the wall and he committed other crimes. So we were able to prosecute him, even though we didn't have those significant injuries. Um, you know, we do everything that we can in order to stop that cycle and kind of put a, 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 a barrier up between the behavior and really just to shine a light on what is really going on in these relationships. And sometimes the most important people who need to have that light turned on is the victim and the perpetrator because they, they get into these cycles and they get into these behaviors and they become commonplace. And it's just like one of those things where, you know, sometimes it's fueled by alcohol and drugs and, and the judicial intervention is really what's needed to stop all that, to clear up drug issues, alcohol issues, and then anger management. And we never put someone in anger management programs until they are clean and sober. So they have to go through, if they have that issue, um, cleaning that up first in order to be able to mentally process the rest. Um, and so I don't know if that got off on a tangent or answered your question. I'm sorry. No, that's good. This is supposed to be a conversation. Too. So that was, that was excellent. Uh, Sarah, your thoughts? Um, yeah, kind of to piggyback on that. Sometimes victims tell me that they just wanted the abuser to get a wake up call. And so sometimes the court system is really helpful for that. It's OK, we're in criminal court now like this is bad. This is a big deal and we need to do something about it. And so sometimes that that is an important step, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the victim wants to leave. They just want their person to get better, to get the help that they need. Um, and so just because they called 911, that does not mean that they're that they want to end the relationship, that they're ready to end the relationship. Um, it can just mean maybe they just they just wanted the abuser to be transported away from the scene that night. Um, they didn't necessarily want charges. I hear that a lot. Is I just I just needed the police for that one night. I'm not interested in pressing charges or anything like that. Um, so sometimes they just feel that they needed the assistance of the police for that moment, and that after that they're like, I can take care of myself. Um, so I hear that a lot. Or again, that um, they wanted their abuser to get some type of wake up call so that they can finally take the steps that the victim feels that they need to take. Um, and again, just going back to that, um, to the reasons that people stay in the relationship, um, there's so many reasons, but sometimes when um, there's a protective order that's put in place um, and the abuser is not ho home like the abuser normally is, um, then there's children, you know, asking for their parent, where is my, where's my dad? Where's my mom? Um, and that can be really hard on the victim. And so, um, so sometimes at first they're like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to leave. I, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go through it. Through it. I'm going to leave. But then maybe the kids start asking for their parent. Um, and then that just makes it really hard when the kids still want both parents in the home. And so sometimes that causes the victim to say, okay, I'm going to give this another chance. I'm going to give my marriage another chance. Um, so it's just it's just so complicated. It's so hard, um, and there's so many reasons um, why someone might continue to to stay in that relationship. So yeah. So so Lisa, let's say that you know the victim is not as willing to participate in you know let's say doesn't is hesitant about the photograph or you know doesn't really want the emergency protective order. And we're going to actually get into the criteria you have in deciding to prosecute. But before we actually get to that, I'm just curious, you know, how that affects your decision uh, making in deciding to prosecute if the victim is as such. So we have a policy in the DA's office that um, that we will uh, file cases. <coughs> excuse me. We will file cases that we can prove. And oftentimes those cases are not dependent on the voluntary um, participation of the victim. 
And the last thing that we will ever do is re-victimize a victim. You know, we're not going to haul them in on a body attachment and treat them terribly. And, you know, we always try to communicate with them. And we try to take the burden away from them to say, like, this is sort of out of your hands now. Because once you, your child, your neighbor, the nurse called 911, now it's our responsibility. Because we do have legal, moral, and ethical responsibilities to pursue justice. And that is not just justice for the victim who may or may not want to participate, but we have children who are involved in these these families that we ha- have a duty to protect because it is not uncommon for child endangerment charges to go along with, um, with domestic violence cases uh, where children are either involved in the actual physical altercation, where children are threatened, where children are not being properly cared for because of the trauma in the family. And the officers will get there and it might be a 911 call about a potential domestic violence, but they'll find no power in the home. They'll find no food in the refrigerator. They'll find dog feces on the ground where, you know, toddlers are walking around because the family is in such chaos um, that survival is really the, um, the, 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 the rule of the day. And so the normal loving, care, caring things that a normal parent should do in a functioning household are not being taken care of. And so you have um, you have extraneous issues that come along when you find those situations. And so it's very important for us to prosecute those cases. And again, not just to tear the family apart, not, you know, we're not about just sending people to prison. We're not about just sending people to jail. We want to help people draw healthy boundaries in the sand to repair their relationships. Because I think just human beings, there's very few human beings, I think, that walk the earth that are just born evil. I don't think that that is, is a reality. I couldn't um, function, I don't think, as a prosecutor if I believed that, that every person who committed a crime just needs to go to jail or prison. That's not it. We're all faulted human beings. And a lot of people are in the situation they're in because of their upbringing, because of their backgrounds. And so we have, you know, there's a saying in recovery, nothing changes if nothing changes. And we sort of try to put that on to the victims to say, okay, we get it that you're in this situation with this person who you love, but we're here to help you draw a boundary, even if you don't want to draw it, because we have children to protect and we have society to protect, too. Because as we've seen in the Fowler case, there are a lot of victims of domestic violence that are not the cohabitant. They are not the parent. Right. And these two gentlemen who who were who were you know brutally murdered by this man because of the nature of his domestic violence rage. That's not fair. So we have an obligation to protect the community at large. And if you look at this statistic, so long-winded, but children who are raised in domestic violence homes have a higher incidence of depression, a higher incidence of suicide. They are less successful in school. They are less successful in their academic endeavors. They are less successful in their jobs. They have a higher incidence of obesity and stress and depression. And so and then they they also are a lot more likely to engage in domestic violence behaviors, drug use, alcoholism or to become domestic violence victims. And so we really take that responsibility uh, very seriously to protect the children and the the community at large, the, the, the other family members, because when you take away a person's family, um, or you are perceived to be taking away a person's family, whether that's through reporting to domestic violence um, or being involved in law enforcement or a church person, a pastor, anybody, that 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 anger in that person and that that need for power and control can can certainly be redirected from the domestic violence victim in the relationship to people on the outside. And I think the national statistics prove that the most uh, dangerous situations for law enforcement officers uh, is is domestic violence calls. Um, we lose more, you know, now we're in sort of this crazy post-George Floyd anti-law enforcement world that we're living in now. And, um, you know, we had some, some issues in the last couple of years, but generally speaking, over the last 15 or 20 years, the law enforcement officers that respond out to domestic violence calls are at a higher lethality risk than any other type of calls because, you know, it's it's personal. It's very personal when someone shows up at a domestic violence call. And, and also, thank you for touching upon one of the things I was going to follow up on. You know, growing up in a domestic violence, uh, you know, home, 
where there is domestic violence and what that is in terms of contributing to later being part of a domestic violence relationship. So, so thank you for touching upon that. And you, the next question was in terms of what you actually look at in deciding whether to prosecute. You did also touch upon that, but just basically it's something that you can prove, right? And you don't also want to re-victimize. Right. So what, what we look at is the, the, first of all, the 911 call is always the most important. And we don't always have those because sometimes people just walk in and, call and, and report. Um, but the 911 call is really the, the one opportunity that we have to actually be in the moment. Um, whether it's, again, an open call, a child, a victim, and people are excited. So when they're excited and they're in the moment, they tend to be more honest than they are later on. So that's a huge piece of evidence. Obviously, medical records, physical evidence, photographs of injuries, all important. Crime scene photos, very important because it gives us just a window into what's happening in this house. Is the house unkempt? You know, are there all those other issues we talked about before going on? Are the children being cared for? Um, you know, what is the what is the situation, the living situation, and are there other crimes being committed? Um, you know, oftentimes in these situations, you'll see that there is child abuse and child neglect issues going on, which adds to the stress. Um, if there are weapons involved, you know, we always try to, uh, the, the law enforcement officers will always try to um, to uh, obtain those through through the search process. Um, and, and weapon and domestic violence is not just a gun or a knife. Um, it can be, I mean, I had a terrible case one time where there was a um, an, sort of an old fashioned baby swing, you know, that you see. And the, um, the very thin aluminum uh, leg of that baby swing was used to brutally, brutally um, beat a, a lady. Um, he had kind of snapped it in half like a, a, you would a soda can. And that rough edge of that thing, I mean, it just wreaked havoc on her, cut her, beat her with it. Um, and it was, it was a brutal, brutal beating with a baby swing. Who would ever think? Um, but people use all kinds of things. They use uh, household items, hammers. I mean, I've had attempted murder cases with duct tape around the neck, um, steak knives, uh, just a simple steak knife you could buy at the dollar store for a dollar can become a lethal weapon. Um, there's a lot of household items that, you know, heavy items, blunt objects, bats. I mean, some people collect uh, machetes, you know, swords, you know, that they, they may have uh, as a decoration on their wall and they take them off and they you know, they use them. Uh, and so it's just, it's brutal. So we use all of that evidence uh, to try to come up with a, a case that we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And and 98% of our cases settle. Um, they settle for a plea. Uh, very few of them go to trial. Uh, but the ones that go to trial is where either there, there really isn't any reason to settle them because they are very significant um, or the defendant just isn't willing to plead guilty. And a lot of the times too, we will find when the perpetrator is in jail, um, they will make several calls to the, the home. They will make several calls to the victim. They'll make several calls to family members. And uh, the, the jail calls are all recorded. They're notified that they're recorded and that's fair game for us. So if we have any uh, inkling that there is any type of um, uh, persuasion or intimidation that's going on. Those are sometimes charges that we add later, um, and those 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 can be tried just the same as the the, the charges involving the actual incident itself. I and mean, then we just add those on if we have the proof, which you know a, a telephone recording is pretty good evidence um, of somebody intimidating somebody or threatening somebody over the phone. If you come to court, I'm going to kill you. If you come to court, it's going to get worse for you. Um, you know, you need to come in. Uh, and 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 lie. You need to tell them I didn't do it. You know, those are all things that we hear every day, all day. Uh, and and even though they know they're 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 being recorded, they still take that chance. So there's all kinds of different evidence that we use, and we do not. You know, if the victim comes into the office and says I don't want to prosecute, we have a form that they can fill out, and oftentimes they lie, you know, or they give another story, and we assess that. I mean, when I'm saying they lie, they give an, a statement that's not consistent with what they what the, what what the evidence of the investigation shows, and we turn that over to the defense attorney. It becomes part of the case, and oftentimes um, we have to treat our victims as hostile witnesses, but we try to do it with respect and understanding that they are in literally like the fight of their life, no pun intended, because they are afraid. They are afraid of the consequences, um, and they know that absent. Uh, you know, a very significant uh, attempted murder case or a murder case where they wouldn't be there anyway. 
um, that, that that guy's going to come out or that gal's going to come out eventually, whether that's after 30 days, 180 days or or four years, they're eventually going to come out. And the fear that it's going to get worse for them when they come out is a lot of the times what inhibits them from participating. And so our prosecutors, just same as the probation officers and the victim witness advocates, we're, are, are specially trained um, to, to deal with that and to understand that. And, and not every prosecutor that works in the Fresno County DA's office is well suited for domestic violence. And because I was a domestic violence prosecutor for so long, I think anybody who's heard anything about the reputation of Lisa Smith Camp will say, oh, she was a DV prosecutor. I went into that unit kicking and screaming, going, I don't want to do this. I don't want to prosecute a subject matter crime where the victims don't care. And uh, and honestly, it was such a great blessing to my life to be able to work with these people who who really needed me. They really needed us. They really needed our service. And the impact that you can have on families and children and people um, is tremendous. I mean, I've, I've been walking back to my office from court and had people come up to me and say, I hated you when you were my prosecutor, but I love you now because our life is better and our family is better. And, you know, I got my children back and I'm off drugs. And, you know, that's super rewarding for all of us. Um, and so when you have to push through the fire of, prosecuting a case with a victim that doesn't want you and doesn't want your help, um, those those results on the back end, sometimes they don't come for years and years, but um, they're very rewarding for all of us in the system. I just wanted to follow up quickly with something you said, Lisa. So the, the fear, the fear after, let's, let's say that it results in a conviction, you know, is a, is a criminal protective order renewed uh, at that point? How does that work? All, there's all different kinds of flavors of protective orders on the scene. The um, law enforcement officers can call for an emergency protective order and they call the judge right away. And those last for 72 hours. Um, and then once the person is um, apprehended and brought into jail and arraigned, then we can issue a criminal protective order. If there is a lapse of time in between the expiration of the emergency protective order and the time that we can get the person into custody, because we have to serve them with those criminal protective orders, then um, the uh, victim can use victim services, they can use Marjorie Mason Center, Central La Familia, they can go themselves and they can apply for a civil restraining order. They can use, um, they can file their own declarations uh, or they can use, uh, try to get a hold of the police report, which sometimes is a little bit difficult, but they can, they can certainly um, attach the police report to those applications for restraining orders and they can do that civilly until we can get the person in the criminal justice system. And then um, we have one criminal protective order that the judge will issue um, while the case is pending. And then whether the person is convicted by trial or plea, then there is a second order, um, a secondary order that is for the period of probation. Um, and some, you know, for stalking cases, they can last 10 years. Um, for certain domestic violence cases that we can petition the court um, under the code. Uh, to to have them for um, for for an extended period of time, but generally speaking, they last three or five years, and then after that, if the victim desires to have them extended, they can do that civilly. Um, if the person if the perpetrator successfully completes probation, then the court loses that jurisdiction, but the victim can certainly go on to civil court and try to get a civil restraining order. And restraining orders are also granted during. Um, child custody uh, uh, hearings, as well as divorce proceedings also. So there's several avenues to which a victim can get uh, uh, some kind of a restraining order. Yeah, and, and thank you for saying that. So again, if, if there wasn't a conviction, you know, the civil restraining order could be an option there to fill some gaps in the situations that you were discussing. So just to make sure it's clear for everyone watching this, that there are those other options in terms of if there is that fear uh, regardless of where it is in the process or, you know, the outcome of a particular uh, incident. Uh, incident. So we're going to uh, move on. I want to be respectful of uh, your time. So we'll uh, kind of conclude here with the rights and resources. You know, we've discussed some during our discussion, but, you know, just may maybe briefly touch upon other rights and resources available during and after the proceedings uh, and, uh, again, just maybe briefly address Marcy's Law, uh, along with restitution rights, plus shelters, uh, relocation, and funeral expenses. And we'll begin with you, uh, uh, Sarah. 
Yes. Um, so like I mentioned, um, we work with the California Victim Compensation Board and um, they can assist in paying relocation expenses. Um, often that's about $2,000. It's meant to be for first month's rent and security deposit on a new place. So um, if someone's not safe where they are, or even if um, emotionally it's difficult for them to be in that place where they were victimized, um, the state the state program, they can help them pay to relocate. And that payment can be um, to the landlord directly, or it can be a reimbursement to the victim. So whatever is easier. Um, so we help with that process. That's kind of like a long process that we help with. Um, the other thing that I always emphasize to victims is home security. So the program that we work with can um, assist in paying home security, whatever that means to the victim, um, a security door, bars on the windows, security cameras, um, anything that feels like security to them. Um, so that's a big one. And um, funeral and burial, if it if it is a domestic violence um, homicide or any any homicides, um, they can um, the program does pay for funeral expenses up to um, seventy five hundred dollars. Um, so that's um, a, a big thing as well. And then, like I mentioned before, therapy. Um, most victims can get um, up to 30 sessions of therapy paid by the state. Um, and that includes any children that were like indirect or direct victims um, of the crime. So I always emphasize that children can receive therapy, but um, and the victims can as well. Um, and then shelters, Marjorie Mason Center is so amazing. All the, they do so many different things. Um, and they have their emergency shelter, of course. Um, so I always encourage people to go there, even if the shelter is full, usually they can work something out um, with a place for people to stay. Um, and they do have rural locations as well. Um, and they have services that can go meet people where they're at. Um, they just have to get linked up with Marjorie Mason Center to, to kind of sort that out. Um, and they have a legal options class, which is really awesome. Um, it's every Thursday at 10. And the legal options class can help them file that civil restraining order. They help them from the beginning of the process to the end of how to fill out that paperwork. Um, they go file it for, to the court for them. They request that the sheriff's office serve the defendant with that paperwork. Um, it's really awesome, all the whole thing that they do, the whole process. Um, so Marjorie Mason Center is a huge resource, but Central La Familia is amazing as well. They help um, with kind of legal stuff um, with U visas and um, T visas and um, restraining order stuff. Um, they're, they're really great. Um, and Marcy's Law, of course, is something that we that we deal with a lot um, and that we always try to educate victims on their rights. Um, a big one that I always tell people is um, the right to restitution. So if there was any financial losses that happened during the crime, so like maybe the defendant broke her window or something or um, damaged a TV or um, things like that, then they can request, um, or cell phones, cell phones is another big one, um, they can request reimbursement for that and the judge can order that the defendant pay the victim back for any damages incurred during that crime that's being prosecuted. Um, so sometimes that's a little bit of a healing process that they get something back for what was done to them. Um, and also they have the right to be present at every at every court hearing. They can come to every court hearing. They can speak to the judge at every court hearing. Um, and they do not have to speak to the defense attorney if they don't want to. I always make sure I tell people that up at the front of the case that they do not have to speak to um, the the defense attorney if, if they don't want to. Um, and there's a whole long list of Marcy's rights. Um, and we, tr we try our best to um, educate and inform victims of their rights at the beginning of the process because it's so important. But um, yeah, I would say those are the main ones, the main resources. Very, very concise. And actually, just before moving over to Lisa, um, just a, a timing question because I, uh, you know, we, we saw it in our um, in our incident here in Fowler that the family had trouble with the funeral expenses, and I believe that they filed, but uh, they had the immediate costs that of a funeral. So, so how is that the, the timing on that? Is it is it just a reimbursement, or can there be an immediate payment to actually facilitate that funeral when it yeah. needs to happen? Yeah. Um, usually the, with the funeral and burial, the state tries to get those done as quickly as they can. Um, so usually it's about two weeks that um, from the time that we submit the application to the time that um, 
the check gets sent. Um, so most funeral homes in, in Fresno County um, know about our program um, and will work with us. So if they know that someone has applied to Cal VCB, then, um, then usually they're okay with waiting for that check for a little bit. Um, but some funeral homes uh, maybe aren't familiar with it or haven't um, worked with us before. And so that, that process is um, maybe they're not okay with waiting for that check. So that could have been the issue. Um, but, but yeah, starting that application process is important and um, it's all online now. So people can apply online now um, and that kind of helps it get started a little quicker, but um, it all depends on how quickly we can get all the paperwork together and, and send it up to the state. So there's a lot of different things that need to happen, but um, for funeral, funeral and burial, they um, will attempt to get the check out within two weeks. Thank you very much. And then uh, we'll, we'll conclude with you, Lisa, same question. And also just please uh, briefly address uh, the idea of the self petition for legal status under the Federal Violence Against Women Act. Okay, so um, really Sarah hit pretty much everything there is with regard to, and they're the experts in victim services and compensation. Um, the only thing I would add on Marcy's law is that from our perspective as prosecutors, um, some of the rights that, that victims do have in Marcy's law is to be present, to be notified, number one, of the charges. And so every time we have a domestic violence case, we send a letter out to the victim saying this case is filed, um, charges have been filed, this is the person you can contact to learn more about the case, or we also send a letter out if, if the charges are not filed so that they know that. Um, also under Marcy's law, the victim has a right to know the sentencing date, whether that's by plea or conviction uh, at trial, and they have a right to come and make a statement, um, and they can submit a victim impact statement. Um, and sometimes that's in favor of the defendant. Sometimes it's just a simple way to say how they've been impacted by that. So we uh, work with probation to facilitate that and it becomes a part, a part of the actual court record. Uh, and if the victim doesn't feel comfortable um, actually reading it in court, it can be read by the prosecutor. It can be read by um, a victim advocate or a family member who's there for support. And it's read into the record and the judge is given that letter to uh, consider upon sentencing. Um, and I think something that is really um, important, especially for our rural communities, is for people to know that, and, and a lot of people um, who are illegal immigrants are very familiar with U visas, but they are, um, they are a tool that we uh, participate in the preparation of documents um, with regard to U visas, and they are allowing people who are victims of crime um, to get a visa to stay in the country. And there are ramifications. You know, you have to report the crime and you have to participate in the prosecution and it has to result in what we call a successful prosecution. But that doesn't mean anybody has to go to jail or prison or anything. It means you can't recant. Um, and so sometimes that's a problem for people who are not in the mode of, of participating honestly and fully. Um, with us, but we do work um, in prepar in preparing those documents. Our, vic our victim advocate inside the DA's office, as well as the, I think some of the people over at Victim Witness, um, they help. The the nonprofits um, also help, and then the victims can apply for um, a a, a, vis a visa to to lawfully stay here. And the reason that the the federal government does that is to encourage people to report crimes. Um, and they also, I think Sarah referred to the T visa. That's the same thing for human trafficking um, victims they can apply for visas. So we, we want to make it, um, I know sometimes law enforcement has the reputation of um, being people who are going to report people to ICE, aid and raids, and the local governments and the local police departments and the local DA's offices are separate from the federal agencies. Um, the people who are in charge of immigration are, I, I'm old school, so I call them ICE, uh, INS, INS sometimes, but I think it's ICE now. Um, they, they are a separate entity from us. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of, a lot of talk about how um, the Fresno County Jail does have ICE in the jail and, and the sheriff has a relationship um, with them that is is for bad guys, for criminals. Um, it's not for victims. Um, and so no police officer is ever going to say when they arrive at the scene of a crime, no, no deputy sheriff, no Fresno police, no Kingsburg police, Fowler police is going to say, are you legal? Because if you're not legal, I'm not going to take this report. That, that just doesn't happen. There is I have in 23 years in this business, I've never seen a police report that has a box that says, you know, legal or illegal. Now, if it comes up in the course of the um, investigation, 
sometimes that happens because the, the victim will say, you know, I'm not legal and he threatened to call ICE on me. Um, it'll come up in that way. Um, but but nobody will be turned away because they are illegal. And it's very important that illegal immigrants know that they need to report this to us and so that we can not only help them stay safe, but we can also help them with U-Visas if that's appropriate. That's uh, uh, a great answer. Thank you. And I also wanted to just thank you, uh, Lisa, for uh, agreeing to participate. And Sarah, thank you for, for your willingness to participate. Your uh, extensive knowledge on this and your enthusiasm is is refreshing and, and also comforting, uh, I believe, for, for those who are facing uh, this difficult relationship. Uh, and Lisa, I also wanted to add with you that originally uh, your staff was scheduled to participate, but I wanted to thank you. I mean, you found this to be so important that you personally wanted to uh, address it. So I really, I think that shows your genuine desire to uh, help victims out there. So uh, thank you. Thank you to you both. Also wanted to quickly thank uh, my wife, Najda, who is a criminal defense lawyer who helped make this possible. And um, just hopefully this provides a resource for, for our community, surrounding communities. And again, thank you very much for your time today. Yes, and thank you. For making it an issue because you know all of us that work in the system especially those of us who have a heart for domestic violence awareness and education will come anywhere anytime to talk to anybody that'll listen because if we can save one family and um, you know if we can talk to 10 people or 10,000 people and we can save one family or one person from a domestic violence homicide or a continued difficult relationship would we'll do it again it really does mean a lot just to see the devastation that was inflicted on this family um, we have to do whatever we can. So again, I, I really do appreciate it. Yes, and thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Thank, thank Great you. job. Take care.